Carol Ann Riddell, and this is Science in You. This month, we bring you a special end of year episode, a look back at some of our most interesting stories from 2015, with topics including your health, the science of art, and this place we call home, planet Earth. We begin with the brain. Do you know what part of your brain controls emotion, coordinates movement, registers sensation? Dr. Max Gomez maps out parts of the brain to explain where our functions come from. It's not a particularly impressive looking organ, considering its importance. It's kind of squishy with numerous blood vessels and covered in membranes called meninges. But its function was a mystery for millennia. Aristotle surmised that mental activity occurred there, but it wasn't for another thousand years that philosophers began to ascribe certain functions to specific brain areas, crude and almost entirely incorrect. Then in the mid-1800s, an American railroad worker named Phineas Gage survived a construction accident in which an iron tamping rod was blown completely through his skull, destroying much of the part of his brain known as the left frontal lobe. And it was noted then that he had a change in his personality. So frontal lobe and personality became um, associated with each other. Neurosurgeon Dr. David Chaliff explains that deficits observed after trauma like gauges or due to tumors, strokes, and other diseases allowed scientists to start to figure out what functions reside in which parts of the brain. Let's start with the frontal lobes, the area that was injured in Phineas Gage. There are two frontal lobes. They're identical to each other. And the most important function in the frontal lobe is personality, affect, executive function, drive, who you are as a person. To be clear, there's a lot of overlap in functional brain areas, but the gross functions have been clearly mapped over the past century or so. The lobes behind the frontal lobes are called the parietal lobes. The parietal lobe has a variety of sophisticated functions, but the two gross functions that it subserves are movement and sensation. So if someone has a stroke, a bleed, a tumor in their parietal lobe, they will have a paralysis or weakness on the opposite side of the body. Those parts of the parietal lobe are called the motor strip, where movement originates, and behind it, the sensory strip, where we register sensation. But not all parts of the body are equally represented. Body parts with lots of nerve endings, like fingers and lips, take up much more brain space. A physical representation of that is called a homunculus, literally a little man that is deformed to show the heavily innervated areas. Since that electrical mapping in the mid-20th century, more advanced brain scanning has confirmed and refined other functional areas, like the complex structures in the temporal lobe of the brain. The temporal lobe is involved with hearing, the temporal lobe, auditory pathways, the temporal lobe is involved with memory, and the temporal lobe is also involved with speech. So the temporal lobe is a very complicated structure. The hippocampus is the part of the temporal lobe that's about as far from the surface as you can get. It's near the brainstem, and injuries in this area can lead to memory defects. And finally, there are the occipital lobes at the back of the brain. That's where vision is registered. And the cerebellum, which sort of hangs off the rear of the brain. That's the balance and coordination center of the brain. It's not just moving your limbs. There's a coordination involved, sitting erect without wobbling. So that's what the cerebellum does. The cerebellum, in a basic sense, is the balance center of the brain. So as much as we know about where certain functions live in the human brain, we're a long way from understanding how it comes up with emotions, creativity, artistry, empathy. It's still a pretty amazing three-pound organ. For Science and You, I'm Dr. Max Gomez. As we often say here at Science and You, science is not just for scientists. Take, for example, music. Our Tina Beth Pina traveled to Long Island to learn about what comes into play when creating the strings for a musical instrument. I'm Tina Beth Pina. When you listen to music, you're enjoying the tune. You're not even thinking about the strings that create that musical instrument's intrinsic sound. But believe it or not, before a set of strings even makes it onto a musical instrument, science and math come together to bring music to life. 
It's a real science behind the engineering of the string. Um, you know that you take into consideration the uh, the alloy, its tensile strength, um, you know its flexibility, how ductile it is, uh, how strong it is. All these things are brought into a, into essentially a formula that we um, put together and, and, and are able to engineer the right spec for a string for a specific instrument. Uh, we're in control of what we feel is the most uh, sophisticated string manufacturing equipment in the world. John D'Addario III knows a thing or two about creating string manufacturing formulas. His family has been engineering strings since the 17th century. Going back to the 1600s in Salieri, Italy, they were literally sheep herders and they used sheep gut for strings. Uh, and that was preferred nylon materials that became uh, the replacement for most uh, gut strings and they were more reliable. Today, we use a lot more different uh, varieties of metals. You know, we use um, nickel, use stainless steel, we use tungsten, which is a very dense material, we use titanium, um, all sorts of different alloys um, as well. And also we use some of the latest uh, state-of-the-art synthetic materials. The basic process for making strings is the same as it was 300 years ago. Everything was done completely manually. Today, we have motors, electrical motors, and highly sophisticated computers. D'Addario uses those sophisticated computers and motors, along with raw core wire materials, to create hexagonal and round wires for a variety of stringed mm -hmm. instruments in their wire mill factory. First step is to draw it, so we start at a larger diameter and draw it down to the final size and shape that we need. Uh, the second step, because we can't make it straight, we have to put it through a, a two-axis straightener where we take the ring cast out and any side-to-side -side sweep. Uh, and then after that, it's either finished and ready to be wound on or have a tin coating put on it. How do you know you're doing it right? At every step on our drawing machines, we have onboard lasers to monitor diameter. It rotates 360 degrees and traces the shape out, so we know we have a good hex shape from there. So now we know we have a, a good cosmetic, the right size, right shape. We'll go uh, and do a tensile test. So basically, wrap the wire around these two uh, chucks and pull it to a brake force to make sure that it's strong enough for the string that it's going to be on the instrument. If it's too weak, it'll break. Uh, if it's too strong, it just fatigues quickly. That's kind of the art. When, science of it where you want it to be strong but ductile mm -hmm. and the trick is to find the right mix. Once the strings are created at the wire mill, they're brought over to the string factory where the manufacturing process for both fretted and orchestral strings is completed. We have a wide variety of strings that we make um, that have different sounds and playing characteristics catered to different types of players and of course during manufacturing if you deviate just the slightest bit from the original design target players will notice and um, they will think it's a defective string. So it's a, it's a huge challenge figuring out how to make strings consistently. Now I know you guys have perfected that consistency. Mm -hmm. How does each string create a different sound? Each string sounds different because of, number one, the material that you use, because different materials sound different. A piece of steel sounds slightly different than a piece of copper. And uh, that's how we manipulate and design the sound of a string by using different uh, materials. Ironically, music string itself doesn't make very much noise on its own. It's when it's set in motion that sound is created. What actually happens is that if you displace the string, you know, if you push the string to one side, let's say you're in the act of plucking it, you displace the string to one side, there's a restoring force. And that restoring force comes from the tension of the string. And then what happens is that if you pluck the string and you let go of the string, it's pulled back into its original position. That's the, the process of vibration. The D'Addario Company manufactures over 700,000 strings daily and are always looking for new innovations. Their most recent breakthrough is the NYXL string, which uses the same steel wire that's used on the Brooklyn Bridge. When you think, consider the history of the Brooklyn Bridge, uh, it's been there for well over 100 years, uh, and what makes that possible is the strength of the high carbon steel wire. We re-engineered the, the manufacturing process around that wire, which resulted in the highest uh, uh, tensile, the strongest uh, high carbon steel wire that, that's ever been used in string manufacturing. That coupled with a new alloy, a uh, new nickel alloy that we use for the round strings on the set has put us into a position where it is the strongest, longest lasting electric string on the market. And not only that, it stays in pitch longer because of its strength. When you have the ability to innovate within the raw material manufacturing process, that just opens the doors to so many different possibilities 
of innovating your, within your own line of product. Although strings are 45% of D'Addario's business, they also manufacture other musical accessories, like reeds, drumsticks, and drum heads. And they use science and math when producing those as well. For Science and You, I'm Tina Beth Pina. From the science of strings to the science of movement. When you think about it, almost everything about dance embodies science. Gravity, motion, and speed, just to start with. Mike Gilliam introduces us to a group of dancers who practice their craft from a scientific perspective. Science plays a role in what Streb is doing because every single thing we do, if you had a scientist walk in and analyze it, would um, result in a formula. It would either be about rebound, it would either be about impact and the difference between those two things. It would be about centripetal force. Streb works out of this studio in Williamsburg where there's no shortage of mechanical devices for her dancers to use as they challenge gravity, even fly. But is what they're doing here really dance? Well, that's a complicated question for me now. I think it will be referred to as an extreme action company. And I think that the future of the invention of action or theatrical presentation of movement is going to be called action art or something else. And it will use equipment and machines just the way an orchestra uses instruments and it will be examining principles that are more tantamount to what is action, time, actual time, space, actual space, and the body, but also the implementation of forces and being able to handle the force. Bigger force the better that the body is capable of taking at any point in time. Ultimately I'm asking what does movement or action as a discipline do best that no other discipline can accommodate. And that's my journey and that's my examination. And I don't think dance has anything to do with it. How does gravity play such a big role in what you're doing? Gravity is, you know, it, it doesn't really play a role in my, in my choreography, it is my choreography. Gravity is the truth about what governs action in our world. And I wanted to show that. Some of the results are fascinating. There's the artificial gravity machine, a rotating floor, developed a few years ago. It has an eight-foot center plug and an outer donut that is six feet wide, both constantly rotating in opposite directions. There's two parts, the center plug and the outer donut, and they go at different speeds and in two different directions, obviously. And what I was trying to show, one, is the audience can change their angle of viewing just by staying where they are, because I'm taking the stage picture and turning it. And I'm also trying to examine formal things such as immediate turn of direction. When you jump from the donut going counterclockwise onto the, onto the plug going clockwise, they immediately change direction. It's just unbelievably, endlessly fascinating how many permutations, and just with those two directions, counterclockwise and clockwise, and with the different speeds and how everything morphs and changes. So it almost looks like you're taking a Rubik's Cube of people and just shaking it up. Streb also uses something she calls the Ascension Ladder. The beautiful thing about ascension is my idea would be that it would be an eternal climb notion. As you start to climb the ladder, it turns almost immediately. And what I'm wanting the dancers to do to keep climbing, whether no matter how fast it's going, and it goes pretty fast, no matter whether it's right side up or upside down. Some simply run as fast as they can before slamming into a plexiglass wall. I just thought, well, why don't, why don't I reinvent the floor? And the audience can see what's happening there. And if you run really fast and plaster yourself onto a hard surface, you have adhesion and cohesion. For a few seconds, you're really stuck on that wall like it's a Velcro wall. At her studio, it isn't rare to see toddlers enjoying the machines and facilities. But she's very particular about the people she chooses to be a part of her company. We pick out the ones and one have very deep analytical brain they are curious about these questions. And some of them involve intense impact and danger and a lot of force and enormous acceleration. Most bodies aren't used to it. Um, but we pick people who have the appetite for that and even more than that, an elegant sense and a deep sense of curiosity. Streb is perhaps most proud of the work done on the London Eye at the 2012 Olympics. 32 dancers on the spokes of the wheel. 
It was all about scale and about distance and about the surprise of the audience encountering this because we weren't able or allowed to advertise when, where, what. And so the audience was like, what? And they'd see bodies were this big on that wheel. And so for me, it's, it's, it's not about you know, how beautifully did I choreograph that dance. It's about how did you ever get people in that spot in space at that moment. But Elizabeth Streb says it always comes back to the science. For me, my first point of entrance, my first point of referral is always science. To see and learn more about Elizabeth's work, check out the film Born to Fly. And she'll also be doing projects around the world called Cities of the World beginning in 2016. I'm Mike Gilliam for Science and You. We all know that water is central to our existence, yet in many ways, our oceans remain largely unexplored, even though they produce 70% of the Earth's oxygen and billions of people rely on oceans for their livelihood. Fabien Cousteau, grandson of legendary ocean explorer Jacques Cousteau, wants to change that with an ambitious project to raise awareness, living in an underwater marine laboratory for 31 days. He spoke to our Vianora Vinca about the experience. I'm glad that we all came out of it in one piece. Uh, you know, there were a lot of uncertainties. This was a theory, really, the project itself. Uh, as epic as it was, and based on real science and, and history as it was, still was a theory. The theory was, let's do this crazy mission and see if people are still interested in the oceans. Dubbed Mission 31, the endeavor took place nine miles off the coast of Florida Keys and 63 feet below the ocean surface, where Aquarius, the last existing underwater marine research lab or underwater human habitat, sits on the ocean floor. In history, there have been habitats built, certainly first uh, by my grandfather and others in the 60s, there were several dozen in history. In the 80s, things changed and underwater habitats disappeared. And I think that's a huge travesty because we've explored less than 5% of our oceans. Since then, even with underwater exploration technologies continuously evolving, Fabian Cousteau says there's nothing like living in an underwater human habitat and being able to explore the marine environment firsthand. A habitat immerses you in the environment and you're, you become uh, very tactile uh, and your senses are very much attuned to that environment, which is invaluable when you're trying to assess things. We're going to do a test. Where's your EGS valve? Steady flow valve. Good to go. I picked some young, aspiring marine biologists to be able to encompass um, a nice, rounded team that could give a foray into uh, robotics engineering, into marine biology and science in general, so that we could get a, a good picture of what the next generation of ocean explorers and aquanauts could be. This is our scientist, this is one of our technicians, and they're going out to one of our sites to bring some of the seagrass to plant around the, there's a seagrass right there, to put around where the predator prey fear behavior models are. And we were studying the effects of the absence of predators on the coral reef with regard to biodiversity. And that really goes into the subject of overfishing and how we're taking away a lot of these essential creatures that make coral reefs healthy. Now we actually just got back from the dive, yeah. hence the wet hair, and it went really well. It took us about maybe 45 minutes yeah. to set up the camera. We're using a lens that um, has a really narrow focus so we can see the details of these little critters. No, 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 don't move the camera. Just let me know when he spits so I can push the trigger. Okay, I'll let you know. But after 45 minutes, we got it. There's a lot of critters that just move really fast. And only with the camera can we see the details of their movement. So it was
was a pretty good day and all. It was a really great day. High five. Yeah. We were able to do over three years of science in 31 days. And that in itself was invaluable. Here we go, end of Mission 31 Alpha. After spending a full month at the world's Early final Alpha. frontier, as Cousteau likes to call the underseas, coming back on land was yet another challenging experience he had to brace up for. It was uh, a bit of an unraveling experience. Uh, for the, the last seven days of Mission 31, I was dreading coming back up because I had gotten so used to being underwater in the world's only undersea marine laboratory, it became my home. Uh, and fish became our neighbors, and we became very accustomed to what that meant. I'm torn. I'm really happy to be back up the surface to see friends and family. I'm a little sad to be leaving our home from the last month, but it's pretty awesome. For Science and You, I'm Viano Ravinka. Now to a story we love about some children who might just be our future engineers. When you think of the Girl Scouts, you might think of cookies or badges. But we found there is a lot more going on, including getting young girls excited about science, technology, engineering, and math. This Brooklyn Brownie troop has a critical mission underway. We're building the arm of the robot, and I think next we've got to do the brain. What will the brain do? It, it will make it like do go backwards, make it to go forward, make it to go sideways, make it spin. This is not your mother's Girl Scouts. For these brownies, the experience goes far beyond the badge. It's an all-out effort to get young girls engaged in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. We wanted to encourage the girls to think about things other than um, what girls might traditionally be um, geared towards. Uh, engineering and the sciences are so important in today's economy. And I know I'm thinking ahead for our girls, but I really wanted them to feel comfortable with it. And I thought, what a great way to feel comfortable with science and engineering than to build a robot. All the girls here love Legos. And what it really is, is Legos added with a computer overlay. I like science because I like seeing if stuff works. Is things work. But for too many girls, that early enthusiasm doesn't seem to translate into the workforce. Take a look at these numbers. Women make up 47% of the total U.S. workforce, but are much less represented in some science and engineering occupations. For example, 39% of chemists and material scientists are women. Only 15.6% of chemical engineers are women. And that drops to just more than 8% when it comes to electrical and electronics engineers. STEM careers are growing. It's, it's definitely um, in all STEM fields they're growing and we want to prepare our girls for that workforce when they get older. The Girl Scouts have done research of their own. It finds girls like STEM topics. An overwhelming 74% of teen girls say they're interested in STEM. So what are some of the potential gender barriers? More than half of girls, 57 percent, say girls their age don't typically consider a career in STEM. And almost half say they'd feel uncomfortable being the only girl in a group or class. One way to beat those obstacles, start early, before ideas of what girls can and can't do take root. Girls can do anything. They can be anybody. And when you catch them now, I think it's such a perfect point because they're so curious about everything. I already planned that I wanted to be a geologist. Health is one way that science applies to all of us all of the time, particularly when it comes to medical advances. For women, breast cancer is one of the most feared diseases, and losing their hair during chemo can be particularly crushing. But some patients have been able to keep their hair with a technique called cold cap therapy. Donna Hanover explains. For many women, the anguish of a cancer diagnosis is worsened tremendously by the emotional pain from losing their hair during chemotherapy. But here at the Weill Cornell Breast Center, some patients are able to use cold caps to reduce hair loss. Hair loss is one of the most dreaded and feared side effects of chemotherapy. Losing one's hair makes one feel sick. Other people treat a woman as if she's sick. Dr. Tessa Sigler says scalp cooling often reduces hair loss. Patients need to wear the cold caps for about an hour before each chemo session starts, all through the hours of chemo and for some time afterwards. 
It's thought to work by two main mechanisms. The one is that the very cold temperatures cause the blood vessels in the scalp to constrict and thereby the chemotherapy isn't able to penetrate the scalp as well. The other mechanism is that the cold temperatures arrest the hair follicles. In other words, it puts the hair follicles to sleep and thereby the hair follicles aren't as well able to take up the chemotherapy. Carolyn Dempsey got a diagnosis of breast cancer in 2013. She first heard about cold caps from a friend in Texas who used the penguin yeah. cap. I was amazed and, and when she told me I wanted every detail about how, how does this work, where do you get these caps. You have to rent the caps from a company in England, uh, it's very expensive, you get them, you have to keep them in your freezer and then bring them on dry ice to your infusion site. It's very, very cold, patients have to wear mole skin so they don't get frostbite on their, on their scalps. And patients need friends or family to monitor the temperature of the penguin caps and change them out every 20 or 30 minutes. While Cornell has encouraged use of the cold caps, and the Rapunzel Project donated a huge room-size freezer. While Cornell also recently helped run a medical trial of the Swedish DignaCap, which has an attached cooling system and a cap that doesn't need to be changed. Carolyn Dempsey was lucky enough to get into the trial. It works phenomenally well and is much more comfortable and less cumbersome than the penguin caps. The results of the trial have been presented and there is eager anticipation of FDA approval. That might also trigger insurance coverage for DignaCap. In all cold cap therapy, one major question is risk. The biggest medical concern about cold caps is the idea that maybe we're not protecting those scalp cells from developing cancer in the future. The data from Europe has been very reassuring to date. Scalp metastases in general are incredibly rare. So we tell our patients that it is a theoretical risk, but we think it is very, very minimal. Dr. Sigler says scalp cooling is best suited to patients being treated for solid tumors rather than blood cancers. In Europe, it's used not just for breast cancers, but also for tumors in other parts of the body. She warns that even with cold cap therapy, there is usually some thinning of the hair. Which we like because it means that the chemotherapy is penetrating the scalp to some extent. As for the benefits, Carolyn says she wants to spread the word. I can't tell you how many phone calls I get from people in New Jersey. So many people would want this. I was resigned that I was going to lose my hair. Uh, once I was able to keep my hair, I, I felt a sense of empowerment. You know, I felt, <laughs> it felt stronger than the cancer. And it was, I'd say, invaluable to my children as well because they didn't see mommy as as being so sick. What did your children think about the pictures of you in the helmet? And they thought I looked like a pilot. <laughs> they thought it looked like mommy was flying a plane. They tried it on themselves at home and took pictures of themselves with the cap on. My patients who've used the cold cap have all been very pleased that they've done it. It's allowed them to protect their privacy and I think has made a big difference in how they've managed and their quality of life. By it, being able to maintain your hair, you look in the mirror and you get to see yourself and not see your sickness. Carolyn and other cold cap users want people to know that as devastating as a cancer diagnosis is, the ability to use the cold cap technology to reduce hair loss can be one way to fight back. I'm Donna Hanover for Science and You. That's our show for today. Join us next month for an all new episode you won't want to miss. We are traveling to outer space. I'm Carol Ann Riddell. Happy holidays, and thanks for joining us for Science and You.